Our New Testament reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 2, beginning to read verse 1. Luke 2, verse 1. The birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, come and fill me with your spirit now. Enable me to preach your word faithfully. Use it, Lord, to empower us and teach us, to change us and help us. Amen. Why did Mary and Joseph have to travel to Bethlehem? Because they couldn't book a home delivery. Why couldn't Mary and Joseph conference call their family when Jesus was born? Because there was no Zoom at the inn. They probably get worse as we go through Christmas. Um, but most of us have heard this reading many times, and we'll probably hear it again this Christmas at this church, at the grandchildren's school nativity play on the radio or on the TV carol services. And as we hear it, we probably have a mental picture of Mary on a donkey arriving with Joseph in Bethlehem as darkness falls. Possibly the snow is falling as they go from inn to inn, knocking on the doors only to be told that there are no vacancies. Everywhere is full. And eventually a kindly innkeeper allows them to stay in the corner of a stable in his backyard, surrounded by lowing cattle. Also, as many of you know, you've heard that this mental picture is probably some way from reality. Firstly, there is no specific reference to a stable in the Gospels. The word manger can be translated as cattle stall or stable but it's better translated as a cattle feeding trough. Secondly, the word that most of the Bible translations translate as inn is not the normal word for a commercial inn. Mary and Joseph were probably not denied a room at uh, Bethlehem's equivalent of Weatherspoons or Travel Lodge. The newer version of the NIV translates that inn as guest room. Luke also uses the same word for the room where Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples, a large upstairs room. So the guest room was likely to be either a large community function room, the kind of place you went for a wedding reception, um, uh, or a room on the roof of a house, or a large extension to someone's house, or if the room was already full of people, um, it would hardly be a suitable place for Mary to give birth in. So Mary and Joseph were given the best hospitality which the owner of the guest room could provide. And they were probably a relative or a relative's relative or a relative's relative's mate. Uh, and Mary and Joseph were offered a space where the animals were kept overnight perhaps a lower part of the house, 
or a stable or a cave in the backyard, somewhere with a manger, somewhere that they could lay the baby, where the cattle or the sheep were normally fed. But before we get to the manger, Luke introduces this chapter by a contrasting reference to Caesar Augustus. He was the first Roman emperor. Like Napoleon, he replaced the Roman Republic with an imperial system with himself as absolute ruler, Caesar Augustus. It means revered or exalted one. When he came to power, he ended a long period of war in the Roman Empire. He was hailed as the Prince of Peace, the saviour of the world. With his reign began the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Under his role, the rule, sorry, the economy boomed and Rome was expanded. Augustus was worshipped as a demigod and people proclaimed Caesar is Lord. And to consolidate his power, Augustus issued a decree to, be, to begin a census of his entire empire the purpose of which was to facilitate military conscription and taxation. Basically, he wanted to know how many men there were so he could tax them and conscript them into his ever-growing army. This Pax Romana was built upon totalitarian power. Augustus murdered his political enemies. He crushed any signs of rebellion. Roman peace was not the peace of freedom, but the peace of fear. So on the face of it, it looked like Augustus was the man in charge. He was the master of the universe. And Mary and Joseph were just two small people among countless thousands who were conforming to his will, who were trudging across a dusty corner of the empire simply so they could be taxed without representation. But Luke shows us the opposite is actually true. God used the pagan decree to fulfill the prophecy of Micah 5.2, which says this, but you Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. You see, God has the invisible hand that so controls events that the true Prince of Peace, the true Saviour of the world, the ultimate King of Kings and Lord of Lords, is born in a manger in Bethlehem to God's divine timetable. See, in our time, there are big and little Caesars who seek to dominate the world with their wealth and power and military force. The poor still get trampled on. And it can seem for us that we are victims of great political and economic systems, forces over which we have little control, despite living in a democracy. You know, our bills go up and down <laughs> and we have no control. But the birth narrative of Jesus shows us that God is ultimately in control, even when it appears sometimes to the contrary. And the pathway to peace will not come through the jackboot and the gun barrel, but through the humility of a baby born amongst the animals and laid in a manger. Steve Ayling wrote an interesting article in the church magazine, I don't know if you've read it, you know, it talks very much about that, you know, how the path to peace doesn't come through the way of violence. God is in control. But moving on. As a child, I went on a week's holiday every summer with my parents to a British seasaw, seaside resort. We went to lots of different seaside resorts. Um, and in those times, we stayed in small guest houses. 
You know, we had bed, breakfast, and evening meal. We played cricket on the beach. We made sandcastles. We went to the end of the pier shows. We had ice creams. We had fish and chips, you know, in the rain. We did all the traditional seaside things you do in Britain. But I do remember the no vacancy signs on the windows of these little guest houses that we stayed in. This is the day before Expedia.com and LastMinute.com. But we never got turned away because my mum always used to book up months in advance. You know, it used to make me a bit annoyed because she, was, she always booked up before our scoutmaster had booked up his uh, scout camp. So I could never go on scout camp because she, she always managed to book it for the, the same week as our scouts. Um, but Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus in the womb, they encountered the first century equivalent of the no vacancy sign until someone showed them some kindness, even if it was giving them space among the animals. I think one practical moral of this is that we too must do our best to show hospitality to others. We don't need to offer rooms that would grace the Ritz, so we don't need to offer Michelin star cooking. We just need to do our best to show kindness to those Jesus would have us welcome in whatever avenue of life. Let's just think at the, at the present time. Who do you want me, Lord, to show hospitality towards this week? There's someone that uh, I come across in my life that I could show a welcome to. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 10. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And to anyone who welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their rewards. The other connected outworking of this passage, much beloved of preachers at carol services, is have you room for Jesus in your life? Or are you putting up the no vacancy sign? Have you room for Jesus in your life? Most of us would say that we've heard Jesus knocking on the door of our lives some years ago and invited him in by faith. But I think the question, again, for most of us is, have we left him standing in the hallway? To continue the metaphor, does Jesus have access to every room in our spiritual house? Or are there areas from which we have consciously or unconsciously excluded him? The loft, the cellar, the hole under the stairs. You know, are there areas of our life that we have excluded from Jesus and we need to open the door to that room? Is Jesus Lord of our family life? Is Jesus Lord of our spending? There's a story when some of the crusaders were baptized, baptized by immersion. They would hold their, their swords aloft so that their, their swords weren't baptized under the water because they wanted the freedom to use their swords as they wished. Maybe today, you know, when we were baptized, did we hold our wallets aloft? Is the Lord the Lord of our spending? Is Jesus the Lord of our media? Have we, have we allowed him into that uh, room where we watch the TV or the computer? Do we take Jesus to work with us? Or is that a separate side of our life completely? Have we allowed Jesus into our social life? Is he Lord of our friendships? Is he Lord of our sex life? Is he Lord of our past life? Is he Lord of our history? Sometimes, you know, our history is painful. And so we lock the door of that painful side to Jesus. And we say, don't go there. Peter Gassaro, in his book, The Emotionally Healthy Leader, 
talks about the shadow side of life. And he says everyone has a shadow side to life. That sounds a bit like we have an inner Darth Vader, don't we? It's gone over to the dark side. But Scazzaro defines the shadow as the accumulation of untamed emotions, less than pure motives and thoughts that, while largely unconscious, strongly influence and shape your behavior. It is the damaged but most hidden version of who you are. We all have a shadow side to our lives. The shadow may reveal itself in simple behaviors, judgmental perfectionism, anger, jealousy, resentment, lust, greed, bitterness. Or it may show itself in more subtle ways as well, the need to be liked, the tendency to overwork, isolationism, shyness. It may be sinful, or it may simply be the result of hurts and wounds. Uh, one of the things that um, I've been doing recently as part of my um, Baptist development is uh, um, looking at strengths and weaknesses. Um, and one of the strengths that people have noticed is that I tend to get things done, which is a good thing. But the shadow side of that is sometimes I can be task orientated. I want to do things my way. And sometimes I forget the needs and feelings of others. You know, we have the light side and the shadow side. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, For God said, let light shine out of darkness. Made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. For we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We need to let the light of Christ shine into every corner of our lives. It's not that we can really close off part of our life to Jesus because he knows us through and through. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Psalm 103 says, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Psalm 94 verse 11 says, the Lord knows all human plans. In Psalm 44, God knows the secret of our hearts. We kid ourselves if we think that we can kid God into not noticing aspects of our inner lives. Because Gazaro says again, regardless of the defensive shield we default to, the consequences of choosing to ignore the shadow are devastating. Now, we can't sh shut off the hidden parts of our lives to God. We can to ourselves, so we can try, but we can't shut them off to God. And we will grow and develop as Christians when we open up the doors of our inner life and allow the light of Christ to drive out the shadow. Now, that may involve things that we know about. You know, the regular confession of our known sins to God. It's called repentance, isn't it? Turning, confessing our sins and then turning away from our sins. It may mean praying the prayer of the psalmist in Psalm 139. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And it may, for those of us whose past may involve some deep hurt, some deep trauma, it may involve the prayer and ministry of wise counsellors, particularly those operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit with discernment and knowledge and healing. Allow the light of Christ to shine into every corner of your life. And then you will grow as a Christian. And we should want to grow as Christians. The problem is, you see, I think some of us don't want to face the pain of that. So we kind of live with the pain and the hurt. 
yeah, and say, oh, I'm just going to, you know, sit there and control it myself. Allow God to change you with his light and his life. But maybe there's also some other doors we need to open to Jesus as well. Maybe the door of our time. You know, are we too busy to pray? If we're too busy to pray, then we are too busy. Yeah. Does something in our life, say work or hobbies, take up too much time and energy? John Wesley said, we are too busy to pray when we are too busy to have power. If you want power in your Christian life, you need to pray. He also said, I have so much to do that I spend several hours in prayer before I'm able to do it. And do we need to open the doors of our church life as well to the Lord? Sometimes we really have fixed ideas of how we want our church to be, don't we? And we say, this is my church. Think about that statement. Ask yourself, whose church is it? Whose church is it? God's church. It's not our church, it's God's church. John Wimber, the founder of the Vineyard Church movement, used to talk about the early days when Jesus said to him, give me my church back. <laughs> we need to open the doors of our church life and let God in by his Holy Spirit. In Revelation 3, 19 to 20, Jesus talks to the church and he says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. We could have the picture, please, Steve. You all know that, uh, that picture, I guess. It's the famous picture by Holman Hunt, The Light of the World. It shows Jesus knocking on a closed door. And notice there is no visible handle on the door because the handle's on the inside. You know, when Jesus knocks on the door of your life, open the door. Don't leave him standing outside. When Jesus knocks on the door of our lives, let's not leave him standing in the street or standing in the hallway, but invite him right into every part of our life. I mean, you may feel that Jesus is doing some work in your life at the moment. He's knocking on some doors in your life. And maybe you're struggling against him. Allow him into those areas of your life to do his healing work. And if you're really struggling with that, you know, you need help with doing that, please let me know. And I'm quite happy to pray with you or to find someone else who can pray with you and for you or the help that you need. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you come to us. You're the compassionate one. You're the understanding one. You're the one that takes away our sin and you gives us the righteousness that John talked about this morning. Your heart is for us and not against us. You're the healer. You know, you're the restorer. Come shine your light into every area of our life that we might grow to be more like you. Amen.